Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready for launch. Mission director. Three. You have permission two, to launch. We have ignition of the RS-68A main engine. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket. Mark 1, executed. And we have indication of spacecraft separation. Good afternoon. I'm Caroline Kirk, a systems engineer at ULA, and your host for today's Delta IV Heavy NROL 91 launch for the National Reconnaissance Office. I'm joining you here from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, where liftoff is currently planned for 2.53 p.m. Pacific. In addition to watching our webcast, you can also follow live mission progress at ulalaunch.com. Our count is currently in the second of two planned holds. At this time, the team is finishing fueling activities. At the request of our customer, we'll end today's live coverage following payload fairing jettison. Before we continue, let's check in on today's weather. The Space Launch Delta 30 forecast is looking good. Here are the numbers. The probability of violating launch constraints is 30%. Ground winds are 10 to 14 knots out of the northwest, and the temperature is 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Visibility is 5 to 7 miles, and the primary concern for today is ground winds. Today's launch is for the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO. The NRO is the leader in developing, acquiring, launching, and operating the nation's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance satellites to secure and expand America's advantage in space. The NROL-91 mission will strengthen the NRO's ability to provide a wide range of timely intelligence information to the national decision makers, warfighters, and intelligence analysts to protect the nation's vital interests and support humanitarian efforts worldwide. Eight sixty-six uh, is the turbo pump supply valve outlet pressure CBC. Roger. And we have a new T0 of 325 and 30 seconds Pacific. Let's learn more about this heavy lift rocket, the only rocket capable of launching NROL-91. Built in ULA's 1.6 million square foot production facility in Decatur, Alabama, the Delta IV Heavy, once fully stacked, stands 233 feet and weighs 1.6 million pounds fully fueled. Three common booster cores, each powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engine, form the first stage. The Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, or DCSS, is powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine. Both stages are fueled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The payload is encapsulated inside a protected two-piece composite payload fairing. With 
Production complete. The three boosters, second stage, and payload fairing travel from Alabama to Vandenberg on ULA's rocket ship. Once in California, a series of events lead to today's countdown. The process begins with transporting the rocket from the horizontal integration facility to Space Launch Complex 6, where the fixed pad erector raises the rocket onto the launch table. Next, the payload fairing with the spacecraft already encapsulated is lifted and mated to the center booster. Once fully assembled, the final preparations take place, starting with moving the mobile assembly shelter, or MAS, back to its launch position. The MAS protects the Delta IV rocket from the wind and fog, so common to its location here on California's Pacific coast. The launch countdown begins with moving the mobile service tower, or MST. Using 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI, the MST is raised eight inches and rolled back, revealing the Delta IV launch vehicle. Using a carriage transporter system and traveling at about a quarter mile per hour, it takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its launch position, 300 feet east of the rocket. With the MST in its final position, the launch team then transitions to fueling and other final preparations. ULA's Delta IV Heavy will head south from Space Launch Complex 6. Let's take a look at today's flight. To mitigate the firewall created by the hydrogen-burning Delta IV Heavy rocket, the staggered engine start sequence begins with ignition of the launch table HBOs, burning off the excess hydrogen injected into the flame duct. Next, the starboard Delta IV Rofi lights, igniting its RS-68A engine. Then, the center and port RS-68A engines ignite to generate more than 2.1 million pounds of total thrust to lift the 1.6 million pound triple core rocket off the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Delta begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. 81 seconds into flight, the Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound. With propellant depleted in the port and starboard boosters, the engines shut down and the boosters are jettisoned to shed their weight. The remaining booster engine then throttles to full power to maximize performance against gravity losses. Once propellant levels deplete in the center booster, the engine shuts down. The Delta IV separation system then activates to release the first stage. The vehicle now weighs approximately 7% of what it did at liftoff. Then, the Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, or DCSS, main engine ignites. During ascent, NROL-91 is protected inside a 5-meter diameter payload fairing. After traveling through the densest part of Earth's atmosphere, the payload fairing is jettisoned. The Delta IV Cryogenic Second Stage will carry the payload to its final orbital destination, where it will begin its national security mission. L minus 44. With today's launch, it's the end of an era here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Today's mission is the final West Coast launch of the Delta Heavy rocket.
Future ULA missions launching from the West Coast will launch on our new Vulcan rocket, set to make its debut next year. Let's take this time to look back at all the spectacular cliffside launches we experienced from Space Launch Complex 6 here at Vandenberg Space Force Base, California. On the rocket, we see mission artwork provided by the NRO. The rocket also includes dedications to teammates who are no longer with us. The NROL-91 mission logo was designed to pay tribute to war fighters, and in particular, the heroism of those that fought World War II, represented by the face of General Anthony McAuliffe. Behind General McAuliffe, we see tanks crossing the Bailey Bridge, symbolizing the ability to overcome and adapt at a moment's notice in the presence of adversity. In the background, a bird of prey represents the strength, endurance, and protective nature inherent in our American warfighters. Along the bottom edge, we read, dedicated to the great task remaining. Derived from President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, this mission is dedicated to protecting our warfighters deployed in harm's way and to the furtherance of that noble cause. Today's mission is also dedicated to ULA employee Don Curtsy. 
Don began his career as a pad technician at Vandenberg Space Launch Complex 2, home of the Delta II rocket in 1998. Don transitioned to Slick 6 when construction began there to support future Delta IV launches. His responsibilities included ground system fabrication, installation, and certification. With Slick 6 fully operational following its first launch in 2006, Don spent the next 14 years supporting launches at all of ULA's launch sites here at Vandenberg, as well as those in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Don will be remembered as a key member of the team and for his concern for his teammates and his community. His genuine kindness towards others, along with his excellent work ethic and expertise, will be remembered by all who knew him. With this launch, we are also remembering NRO teammates. Let's listen in to Mission Director Colonel Chad Davis. L minus 33 minutes. Done. MD, LC, net one. Yeah, MD. MD, I'll turn net one over uh, to you for your dedication. Roger. Today's launch is dedicated to the memory of several NRO teammates. William Preston Kahn de devoted his 48 year career in NRO's Office of Space Launch, enhancing our national security launch mission. 
Godspeed, Bill. Larry Loveland was a kind soul, friend to many, devoted husband, and proud father. For 29 years, Larry provided dedicated support to the NRO and was an expert in translating mission-critical launch requirements. Loved and missed by all who knew him, Larry is forever in our hearts. Dan McKaylee's 33-year NRO career included tours in multiple directorates where he provided dedicated mission support to the warfighter. Men and women across our nation who were deployed in harm's way returned home safely to their loved ones thanks to the intelligence delivered by the satellites that Dan kept in mission. For 35 years, Perry Fath went the extra mile to deliver premier mission payload capabilities, providing vital strategic intelligence to the White House and tactical intelligence to deployed warfighters. Perry was a brilliant engineer, laser-focused program manager and director who believed in a one-team partnership. Though gravely ill, he passionately and selflessly strove to fulfill his lifelong mantra, never compromise the mission. MD out. Thank you, MD. This is Delta Mission Control. Activities are on track to support a new launch time of 3.25.30 p.m. Pacific. Yeah, I have three uh, items that we discussed uh, much earlier that I uh, would like to close with briefs to you. Roger, LDNet one. LDN one. MDNet one. MD. Proceed AC. Okay, first was we had two RLM exceedances noted. Uh, this was tied to a uh, uh, temperature change in the uh, core uh, 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 engine inlet, and uh, this was attributed to a, uh, a helium bubble that uh, was uh, passed through the system. Uh, we have evaluated that, both uh, uh, the Denver team and R-68. We have no concerns with that uh, uh, bubble being uh, there, and, and it's been passed, and we uh, recommend proceeding on that one. Uh, LC concurs. LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. Oh, okay. Second. Second one was the uh, fill and drain valves on the core and starboard. We had uh, uh, issues with getting them uh, to cycle. Uh, we did uh, some uh, dis uh, discussion on that, and the uh, plan is uh, with the uh, uh, cycles that we did perform at that time, we were confident proceeding with the rest of the count. Uh, we will do a standard uh, uh, cycle of them at uh, the new, what would be L minus 25 minute mark. And uh, assuming that that is uh, uh, successful, we will uh, recommend proceeding. We are recommending proceeding based on that. LC concurs, LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. Okay, and the last one was also uh, a couple of RLM items. Uh, this was tied to the uh, turbine supply valve uh, pressure setting. This was also determined to be a uh, issue with where we were in the countdown versus where uh, RLM was monitoring. Uh, so a uh, uh, go ahead, knock, there, knock. So a condition that was uh, uh, n not expected but uh, completely understood. We will um, recommend proceeding on that when uh, it was only due to a delay in the count for today. LC concurs. LD. LD concurs. And MD. MD concurs. And uh, RLM, LC, that one. It's RLM, go ahead. I just want to verify with you the engine in, inlet OTCs, they've uh, all been cleared. Negative. 
I uh, was getting ready to do that, and then the uh, I received the, the the second set of OTCs, eight six and eight six six. Okay. So it interrupted me from clearing them. All right. Go ahead and clear those, and then after the L25, uh, we'll be able to clear the other two. Roger. Delta rockets have launched many of the world's vital space assets. Let's take a look at the impressive legacy of the Delta family of rockets. Though first launched in 1960, Delta's story really begins in the mid-1950s with the development of the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. Named after the Norse god of thunder, Thor was created in response to a growing fear that the Soviet Union would beat the U.S. in the deployment of a long-range ballistic missile. The goal was to design a system that could deliver a nuclear warhead to a target 2,300 miles away, the distance between the United Kingdom and Moscow. On January 25th, 1957, the first Thor lifted off from the newly constructed Space Launch Complex 17 at Cape Canaveral. Following a series of early failures, the Thor team celebrated their first success on September 20th, 1957. In all, 59 Thor IRBMs were launched, with the last flight occurring in 1975. Thor began the transition from missile to space launch vehicle in 1958. On October 11, 1958, America's newly formed space agency marked its inaugural launch when Thor Abel boosted NASA's Pioneer One on a mission to the moon, and NASA's long partnership with Thor was born. NASA and the Douglas Aircraft Company began development of the fourth and longest lasting Thor configuration in April 1959. Using a Thor first stage and a Vanguard second and third stage, Delta-1 lifted off on May 13, 1960 from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 17. Though its first launch was not successful, the Delta team quickly pinpointed the failure. Three months later, delivered NASA's Echo-1 communication satellite to orbit. Following Echo-1, the Delta team racked up an impressive 22 successful launches. Led by Bill Schindler, the Delta rocket earned its industry workhorse moniker for rapidly establishing itself as one of the most reliable and versatile launchers. During the 1960s, Delta launch vehicles paved the way for the burgeoning communications industry, launched America's first weather satellites, and sent probes to explore our universe. AT&T's Telstar-1, the first commercial communication satellite, launched in 1962. And in 1963, SYNCOM-2 became the world's first geosynchronous satellite. Tyros or television infrared observation satellites, provided the National Weather Service with humans' first view of the Earth's cloud cover. In orbit around the Earth, Moon, and Sun, NASA's Explorer satellites provided us with a deeper understanding of the solar wind, cosmic rays, as well as Earth's magnetic field and radiation belts. By the end of the decade, launch vehicle modifications, including the addition of solid rocket motors and an upgraded third stage, made it possible for Delta to orbit satellites 10 times larger. The 1970s was an international decade for Delta, as the manifest included scientific and communication satellites for several countries across North America, Europe, and Asia. Perhaps the most demanding challenge of the 1970s was the launch of the Earth Imaging Earth Resources Technology Satellite, later known as Landsat. The mission for the Earth Sciences community required major changes to the Delta propulsion and guidance systems. During the 1980s, Delta continued its reliable service to the communications, weather, and Earth imaging communities. As capable as the Delta rocket proved to be, 
Production came to a halt in the early 80s when national space policy dictated that the space shuttle be used as the U.S.'s primary launcher, signaling the end of the expendable launch vehicle. But in 1987, the Delta team picked up where they left off and development began on a launch vehicle to support the Air Force's global positioning system. On February 14, 1989, Delta 184 began a new chapter in space launch history as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 17. Demonstrating an incredible feat, the Delta II had gone from development to launch in just two years. To accommodate the larger GPS satellites, engineers improved the Delta rocket in several ways. The fuel tanks were stretched, a new payload fairing was developed, and larger solid rocket motors were incorporated. The modifications resulted in increased performance and flexibility. By the mid-1990s, the Delta II had delivered the fully operational 24-satellite GPS constellation. And though it was developed for the Air Force, Delta again became a reliable partner to both NASA and its commercial customers. Over the course of its more than 20-year run, the Delta II has launched some of America's best-known scientific and exploration missions. Plus four, three, two, we have main engine start. Zero and liftoff of the Stardust spacecraft, liftoff of the Delta II rocket carrying the spirit from Earth to planet Mars. Liftoff of the Delta II with Grail, journey to the center of the moon. On the commercial side, Delta II launched the Global Star and Iridium constellations, which brought satellite telephone communication to the world. Continuing its evolution to meet the growing demands of its satellite customers, the Delta team developed the more powerful Delta III. Though short-lived, the Delta III doubled the performance of the Delta II. Have ignition, ignition and liftoff of the Boeing Delta III rocket. Stage systems looking normal. The engine burners keep burning normally in all six rounds. In partnership with the Air Force's evolved expendable launch vehicle program, the Delta team began development of the next generation Delta rocket in the mid-1990s. And we have liftoff of the first oh, Boeing yeah. Delta IV rocket carrying the W-5 telecommunications satellite for Utilsat of France. All Delta IV configurations begin with the common booster core powered by the RS-68A main engine. The Delta IV Heavy, with its three common booster cores, deliver our nation's largest missions to orbit. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket, carrying the NROL-32 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Delta IV launch vehicles are produced at a 1.5 million square foot state-of-the-art facility in Decatur, Alabama. Processing and launch takes place at Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Range safety arm light on. Right. Permanent. Range ready. Ready. Water system ready. From its early beginnings as a weapon and deterrent through its transformation into a space launch vehicle, Delta has reliably supported our nation for more than 60 years. Delta's legacy as a workhorse continues today and is a testament to the persistence, dedication, and commitment of an enterprising team that has continually evolved the Delta rocket to support a changing world. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket. ULA's Vulcan rocket is nearing its inaugural launch. Here is an update. Vulcan Centaur production begins with aluminum sheets expertly machined to remove more than two-thirds of the weight, resulting in the structurally strong yet lightweight orthogrid panels that form Vulcan's propellant tanks. The panels are then bump pressed to form the curves required to complete the tanks. At the same time, rings, adapters, and other structural components are precision milled. Next, 
the aluminum domes, panels, and other structures that form Vulcan's propellant tanks are first cleaned and etched to a smooth, even surface, and then anodized to harden and prevent corrosion. Following an ultrasonic inspection, five completed panels for the liquefied natural gas, or LNG tank, are assembled and joined together using friction stir welding. Unlike traditional welding, where filler material is used to join components, friction stir welding uses a head to stir the metal of the two panels together as it moves down the seam. The resulting joint is stronger and produces a lighter weight, higher performing tank. The process is repeated to create the liquid oxygen, or LOX tank, followed by attaching domes to complete the tanks. Circumferential friction stir welding is then used to join the two propellant tanks that comprise the Vulcan booster. As production continues on the booster stage, stretch forming gore panels for the Centaur second stage propellant tanks is underway. The stainless steel gore panels are welded together to create the propellant tank domes. The gore welder is one of several highly specialized welding stations in the Centaur production process. Just down the aisle, Centaur 5's massive intermediate bulkhead is mated to its ultra-thin tank. Once both propellant tanks are welded, they're mated together to create the Centaur 5 second stage. Once the propellant tanks are joined, the 5.4 meter booster is sprayed with foam insulation before moving to final assembly. Twin BE4 engines are hot-fired and then mated to Vulcan's thrust structure. With production complete, the booster makes its way onto ULA's rocket ship for its journey to the launch site. Meanwhile, at Cape Canaveral's Space Launch Complex 41, the water suppression system has been upgraded and tested, along with other modifications, including new, larger fuel storage tanks. In the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF, platforms have been modified to accommodate the larger Vulcan rocket. Following the eight-day journey to Cape Canaveral, the booster is offloaded and transported to the VIF, where it is lifted onto the newly constructed Vulcan Launch Platform, or VLP. The first Vulcan booster then travels a third of a mile to the pad for testing, followed by 2.7 miles to the Spaceflight Processing Operations Center, or SPOC, for additional testing. This launch site testing culminates with another trip to the pad, where the locks and LNG tanks will be filled and chilled to flight levels and temperatures. LC locks too. I locks you. At this time, second stage locks is ready for terminal count. Roger. OS, LC. Go, LC. First step 1170OM, perform vulnerable data transfer to backup CCLS. Roger. Last month, ULA successfully launched Sibir's Geo-6 for the Space Force. Let's take a look at the highlights from that mission. Flight Control, perform launch on time verification. Roger. OSM, place SRB ignition SNA switch in the enable position. SRB ignition enable. Redline monitor, verify redline monitor, and event table in the correct configuration for terminal account. Verified. RC, verify solar radiation acceptable for launch. Verified. Securing Centaur LA2. Securing Centaur LA2. Launching. FKFR. OCU launch. Change count start. Fin valves locked. Rock report range status. Range green. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Centaur. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying Sibir's Geo-6 for the United States Space Force. The 
tower and it's beginning to pitch you off the maneuvers. Passing 50 seconds in flight, Mach 1, Atlas 5 is now supersonic. Vehicle is now passing with max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. And we have indication of data center both SRVs. Good indication of payload bearing jettison. L minus twelve minutes. MEQ, LC. Go. Initiate retract data logger just prior to the L seven pole. Roger. LC has gas. Go has gas. Uh, per step 1180, would you like me to switch to the launch table scan pattern? Affirmative. Roger. LC on one AC. Go AC. Okay, we uh, did troubleshoot the fill and drain valve. Uh, we cycled them uh, 10 times. We're uh, in good condition. We recommend proceeding. LC concurs. Proceeding with count. All communications switch to channel one. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. L minus 10 minutes. RC, verify saw radiation limits acceptable for launch. Verified. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall now hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. OS, flight control, perform launch on time verification. Roger. OSM, verify the hold fire switch is in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify the red line monitor and vent table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. L minus nine minutes. LC flight control, launch on time verified. Roger. LC. Following liftoff, viewers watching from Southern California may be able to see the Delta IV Heavy in flight. To get a closer look at this visibility map, check out at ULALaunch.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. L minus eight minutes.
This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. We remain in the planned hold as launch preparations continue. In a few moments, launch conductor Scott Barney will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the count. 27 engineers and managers are pulled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Space Force Western Range. The vehicle system readiness poll includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as Scott Barney performs the final polling of the launch team. Status check to proceed with terminal count. First aid systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Com. Go. GC cube. Go. Operation support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Has gas. Go. ECS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC verified T0 is set for 22 colon 25 colon 30 Zulu. Verified. L minus six minutes. Establish swing arm lock pins pull. Active. Polling is complete. The ULA launch team and the NRO mission director are go for launch. From T minus four minutes until launch, you will be hearing Scott Barney guiding the team through the final steps in the countdown procedure. Several critical activities occur in the final minutes before launch, including verifying fuel tank levels and pressures in the port, center, and starboard boosters, and the DCSS, as well as arming the flight termination system. At T minus 15 seconds, the launch table HBOs are ignited at the base of the vehicle to burn off excess hydrogen. At T minus 7 seconds, the starboard CBC engine is ignited. At T minus 5 seconds, the port and center CBC engines are ignited. Then, after seeing the Delta IV Heavy lift off, you'll begin hearing flight commentator Rob Kesselman providing launch vehicle ascent data. This is Delta Mission Control. The countdown clock has resumed and we are go for launch at 325 and 30 seconds Pacific. With liftoff approaching, we're going to raise the volume on our launch team so you can hear the final preps taking place. Three oh seven. Two forty nine FPS internal.
CBC locks at flight pressure and flight level. TBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. Two minutes. 159. Vehicle internal. Hydraulic pressure at 4,000. 155. Launch sequencer start. One forty. FCS launch enabled. One thirty seven. T minus 90 seconds. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and Western Range are go for launch. 120. FCS count started. One minute. Agent Starbucks, go. One minute. Rock, report range status. Rock, range green. Roger. 50. Second stage LH2, secure at flight level. 30. Status check. Go Delta. Go NROL 91. Fourteen point five. Roughy ignition. Ten. Test or start. T minus ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. We have ignition. Two, one, lift off. and liftoff of the last West Coast United Launch Engine Alliance Delta IV on. heavy rocket carrying NROL 91 for the National Reconnaissance Office. Vehicle has now begun the pitch over maneuver. All three RS-68 engines look good at this time. Core booster is now throttling down to the partial thrust level. And that core booster We're has now the reached the desired Rob Kesselman thrust providing thrust launch vehicle ascent data. The parameters continue to look good. Vehicle is now three miles in altitude, five miles downrange distance, traveling at a velocity of 1,000 miles per hour. Engine parameters continue to look good at this time. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Mach 1, Delta 4 is now supersonic. Port, starboard, and center RS-68 engine parameters are within the expected operating parameters right now. The second stage reaction control system pressurization valve has opened. Delta 4 now 130 seconds into flight, flying at an altitude of 19 miles, downrange distance of 14 miles. Delta 4 has gone closed loop guidance. Vehicle body rates are as expected.
three minutes remaining in the booster phase of flight. Delta IV rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. One minute in port, until port and starboard booster engine cutoff. And all three RS-68 engines are showing good performance this time. Vehicle body rates are near zero. 30 seconds remaining now until the port and starboard booster engines cut off. And two minutes remain in booster phase of flight, two minutes remaining until BECO. Strap-on boosters are now throttling down to the partial thrust level. Engine response looks good. We've had strap-on booster cutoff and strap-on separation. The center core RS-68A is now throttling back up to the high power level. The upper stage lock system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the RL-10 engine. One minute remaining in the booster phase of flight. And now the upper stage fuel system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. Core engine chamber pressure continues to look good at this time. That core booster is now throttling down in preparation for BECO. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff. And we have stage separation, so successful separation of the first and second stages. We're seeing the nozzle just deployment begin on the upper stage engine. And we have pre uh, ignition on the DCSS. This is this Delta Mission Control at T plus six minutes and 30 seconds. We just heard flight commentator Rob Kesselman confirm the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight, and all systems continue to operate nominally. At this time, we'll end our live coverage. For more information about the Delta IV Heavy Rocket, please visit ulalaunch.com or join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Caroline Kirk. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. And before we leave you, let's take another look at the final West Coast Delta IV Heavy Launch. Roughly ignition. 10, test or start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four. We have ignition. Two, one, lift off. and liftoff of the last West Coast United Launch Engine Alliance Delta IV on. heavy rocket carrying NROL 91 for the National Reconnaissance Office. Vehicle has now begun the pitchover maneuver. All three RS-68 engines look good at this time.